hearing what you've got to say. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. So in August 1914, uh, Britain declared war on Germany. Um, the patriotic folk of Bremhill were quick to mobilize in support of the war effort. And I have to say that the local women were no exception. Uh, if I can get my slides to start working. Ah, oh, <laughs> I've got too far forward. Uh, just bear with me. Nothing like a technical issue to start you off. So in East Tiverton, Mrs. Alice Collett of Barn Bridge supervised a British Red Cross voluntary aid detachment. From late 1914, these women knitted and made garments such as pajamas, nightshirts, shirts and mittens to be taken to the British Red Cross depot at Chippenham. Their work was sorted and distributed to either the local convalescent hospitals, such as that at Chippenham Town Hall, Bowood House or at Khan, or to the Red Cross Central Committee to be sent on to the front. Alice had been a nurse. Uh, she trained at Salisbury, but she'd lost a leg due to a nasty infection. It made her more active participation in the war effort difficult. This Red Cross Working Party or Voluntary Aid Detachment, VAD as they were known, uh, gave Alice and women like her the opportunity to contribute to the war effort in a part-time way. Consequently, the group spanned women of all ages and social class. It comprised of about 30 drawn mainly from East Tiverton and Tiverton Lucas. The ladies included a farmer's wife, Emma Brewer, in her 70s, and Isabel Whittle, a labourer's wife, in her 40s. Miss Emily Strange uh, was in her 20s and likely to have been a domestic servant. And Edith Newman was only about 11 when she joined the group alongside her mother, Sarah, who was a labourer's wife. Uh, the youngest um, member was Hope Heath, aged just nine, who at the end of the war earned a Red Cross VW badge for her efforts. She sadly lost two brothers in the hostilities. The younger members of the group, along with the very eldest, generally knitted while those of more of a working age created the garments. Some members of the East Tiverton uh, homework party were practicing Moravians, and these included their supervisor, Alice, and also Elizabeth Hollis, formerly the Moravian Girls Boarding School's headmistress. The girls' school was also actively involved, often by holding concerts to raise funds for the Red Cross. In April 1916, an audience enjoyed performances from the girls that included Land of Hope and Glory, several pianoforte duets, a dialogue from Shakespeare's Henry V, and uh, my favorite, a display of dumbbell exercises to music by five girls. This type of activity was reflected in the wider parish community too. And there were local collections to provide fresh food, most often eggs, um, to the Red Cross Hospital at Chippenham. Uh, and and if I can just get my, uh, sorry, and this is the um, hospital at Chippenham at the time. Uh, the homework um, parties, fundraising and donations were not the only ways that local women supported the Red Cross. Fanny or Annie, as she was known, Ferris of Bosnia Farm joined the Red Cross at 16 before the war started in 1913. She a Red Cross Auxiliary Hospital created by uh, Lady Lansdowne at Bowood House. In 1915, uh, Fanny transferred to the Chippenham Hospital at its opening. She later became a staff nurse tending to men convalescing from the injuries um, uh, they'd sustained in the hostilities and had first been treated at the military hospitals such as at uh, Bristol Royal Infirmary in Southmead. Uh, Fanny worked over 5,000 hours during the course of five years and received an award for honorable service at the end of hostilities from the division's vice president, Lady Margaret Spicer. It is worth mentioning actually that some uh, local parish women who supported the Red Cross, both in the community and in the hospital did so alongside um, male family members. 
In Fanny's case, her father, Walter, organized the collection and uh, delivery of equipment for the hospital. Many other women worked alongside Fanny uh, from the village, and these included Clara, Eva, and Lily Rose Bryant of the beaches at Tillerton Lucas, who worked two days a week as mess room workers, and uh, Francis Jeffries, who cleaned the wards. Bertha Lewis of Jay's Farm at Stanley mended clothes. One of the most surprising women I found that worked at the hospital may have been Minnie Ship of Cadnam Manor, uh, who worked as a head cook. I have to say Minnie wasn't the cook at Cadnam Manor. Her husband, Edgar, and herself owned it. Minnie made the roll call of honourable service and was mentioned twice in military dispatches uh, for what I haven't been able to ascertain. Her husband, Edgar, was active in local politics and I note often involved at the tribunals to decide the cases of men who appealed against conscription into the army. In November 1915, Minnie's daughter Ivy started work at the hospital alongside her mother as a part-time cook. Uh, elder daughter Vera also joined in the kitchens in January 1917, but soon after began nursing instead. I should add that um, I understand from David Wood that superintending the kitchen at the same time, as well as providing uh, services as an entertainment officer, was a lady by the name of Ethel Williams of Chippenham, whose granddaughter, I understand, lives in Bremhill today. Surprisingly, I've not found a significant presence of local women, either among the volunteers or the paid staff at uh, Bowood House. And if I can get my little, um, yeah, there we go, and that's the um, hospital at Bowood. The land stands of Bowood House still owned much of Bremhill Parish at the time, so I find this quite surprising. I understand that the hospital was very much the baby of Lady Lansdowne and its operations stood slightly outside of the organisation of the other local Red Cross hospitals. Whether this put off Bremhill women or the opportunity to work there was somehow denied them is difficult to say. Suffice to say that local women also worked in many other hospitals, both near and far, and these included um, Gertrude Erlen or uh, otherwise known as Nell Griffin, who'd been a dressmaker at Stanley before the outbreak of hostilities. She became a paid Red Cross nurse and served at their hospital in Bath from 1917 until February 1919 when she um, married. I have to say there is an absolutely stunning picture of uh, Ellen in her Red Cross uniform that's on Ancestry, but I have not uh, reproduced it here. Um, as I don't have permission to do so, but if you can check it out, please do so. Despite Ellen's experience, most of the local women who volunteered for the Red Cross didn't receive any payment for the uh, work that they provided, but there were many opportunities open to women to do paid war work. Once men began to be mobilised, women were increasingly encouraged to work on the land, the men of Bremhill Parish were predominantly employed in agriculture, so the scarcity of men in this respect was uh, quickly acute. In 1916, Lord Selborne, president of the Board of Agriculture, visited Devizes and probably reflected the views of many by both encouraging women to work locally into, in food production, while adding he had no wish that women should compete with men. He added, uh, it, he would regard uh, such competition as a social calamity. And I have to say that Wiltshire women were reticent too. The women's suffrage newspaper, The Common Cause, noted that the county's women had done less and less work on the land over recent years, and many were prejudiced against doing so. In Bremhill Parish, while farmer's daughter Elsie Mighty milked the cows and looked after the poultry on her father's farm at East Hiverton, in 1916, with his sons joining the army, Father John complained that he couldn't get local women to work for him. Planning for a women's land army uh, in Wiltshire began apace. Uh, if I can get my screen to change, there we go. And a recruitment campaign um, advertised uh, 
in the local press the following year for a local recruit. By June, about 150 women had signed up. And by the end of the war, the Wiltshire Agricultural Executive Committee reckoned 600 women had been locally within Wiltshire mobilized into the land army. Plus there were several thousand more, which they called village women workers on the land. Unfortunately, there is no central list of those who joined the World War I land army, all those who were locally commuted recruited directly into farms but I can say that in Bremhill Parish women were certainly encouraged to take the place of men. John Ponting of the Dunpost Inn was told he wasn't exempt from the army on the grounds that his wife could take over his small holding. He had appealed against his conscription on that grounds. While I have not found the full names of those who were awarded for their war work in the land army, I have to say there is a preponderance of local surnames like Free Guard and Ginjal, which make me um, suspect that uh, a few local women may well have done so. There was also other paid war work available to local women. Uh, I understand that the most significant of these was at the railway signalling works of Saxby and Farmer, later Westinghouse at Chippenham, which was given over to munitions production during the war. It seems from the research already done, however, that uh, the women that they employed there generally came from Chippenham itself. So I've been unable to find a direct connection between the local munitions work and the parish. Although I know from Isabel's uh, research into the children of Bremhill School that um, the children were being asked to gather acorns for the production of cordite from munitions manufacture. Female munitions workers, like women who worked on the land, were subject to um, some local ambivalence by um, the men. While the North Wiltshire Herald observed the women employed by Saxby and Farmer engendered, and I quote, the spirit and united effort of both sexes in one common aim that would win the war. It also saw fit to add that entertaining the injured military personnel at Chippenham Hospital, they showed that they had lost none of their feminine accomplishments. There is very definitely a sexist subtext to a lot of the local reporting, I have to say. Women's work opportunities did have an effect on the local economy. Uh, women of Chippenham Laundry went out on strike demanding more money uh, as their wages were lower than that paid in the local munitions works. And a government report found later in 1919 that the wages of Wiltshire women had risen dramatically during the war. And I imagine, I imagine rather that those of Bremhill Parish women uh, were equally followed suit. But I have to say that these effects are likely to have been short term. Uh, the war finally ended in 1918. At a ceremony to mark the end of hostilities, one of the Red Cross medical officers in Chippenham, Dr. Wilson, paid homage to the many um, volunteers who supported the hospital through the war. Uh, and I quote from him, the work in the early days of the war might have been regarded by some mainly as an amusement, but for four and a half years it had involved continuous hard work, often carried out at great sacrifice, and those who perform this strenuous hard work are deserving of our most heartfelt thanks. But despite uh, the war's end, uh, local women's war work didn't immediately stop. Lily Rose Bryant worked at the Red Cross Hospital in Chippenham up until April uh, 1919, as the hospital continued to operate looking after returning soldiers. Even later, Bremhill resident Elizabeth Smith was still employed as a charwoman at another hospital at um, the Pavilion at Khan until July 1919 and the Wiltshire Women's Land Army was only finally demobbed at the end of November. Uh, at the end of hostilities, the women of the Land Army who wished to keep within the profession were promised assistance to emigrate to the colonies or help towards uh, land settlement in the British Isles. But I have to say that there was clearly an expectation that women locally would simply resume their more traditional roles. 
the chair of the Wiltshire Ladies War Agricultural Subcommittee anticipated that, and I quote, some girls who have been a, who have been a little difficult will cause us a certain amount of anxiety during the transition period of leaving the land army and gaining useful employment. Despite efforts to form an association of Wiltshire lands women, uh, employment patterns in the sector quickly snapped back and a government report soon noted that Wiltshire women are no longer counted upon. Uh, this experience seems to have been reflected too in those who supported the Red Cross. Nurses like um, Fanny Ferris and um, Ellen Griffin married soon after the war and uh, most of their activities um, otherwise ceased. In 1939, both Fanny and um, Ellen were undertaking unpaid domestic duties. It seems that they had become um, housewives at war's end. Ellen's husband, I have to say, was Robert Broomfield, a grocer at East Chiverton, so she remained local. However, a few women who volunteered in the Red Cross local division went on to develop their medical training and in some, and some even decided to emigrate. Vera Shipp had been a nurse at uh, the Red Cross Hospital in Chippenham until April 1919. In doing some research yesterday, I found that in September of the same year, Vera boarded a ship bound for Singapore. On the passenger list were several other seemingly unaccompanied single women who, like Vera, had recently been working at Red Cross hospitals across the country. They were all headed to the same ultimate destination in Malaysia, and I think it's probable that Vera was thus continuing her journey uh, which had begun with her war work at the Chippenham Hospital, and she was starting a new adventure uh, abroad. These stories, I think, are important because uh, they depict the more forgotten sacrifices. I think we're much more familiar with the stories of men on the front line in World War I than we are with what was going on at home to support them. The war work of women in the Second War, I, I think, is better known, but I think the history of women and women's experience in general has generally been downplayed. And even now, I think it's much less understood. I think that it's important with our work on this project that uh, we acknowledge that and I think try and address it. And I hope that this talk has helped to um, start that process and I have to say that some of these stories really did surprise me and just the sheer variety of the work that local women were doing. Um, that's all really. I, I just want to say that going forward I think it's important that we continue our work with um, the oral histories so that we can bring out some more of these um, wartime stories and stories of um, village life that continued after war's end um, that's it. I just want to say thank you very much for your time. And also, actually, to acknowledge the fact that um, in doing this talk, because I've been very limited in getting to the archive, I've had some brilliant support from uh, David Wood at, at Bremhill and also uh, Nigel Polcock and Ray Alder, who do, has done a lot of work on uh, women and the local Red Cross. So thank you thank very you. much. That, that, that's most most interesting. A um, lot of fascinating stories coming out there. Um, let's open up for questions now. Um, and um, uh, if you've got a question, please put your hand up or just speak. I don't think there are that many of us that it'll become too chaotic. Um, who'd like to go first? Elio. Um, Louise, I thought that was really great. Um, <laughs> By the way, for everybody else, I last saw Louise, I suppose, in February last year, this last year, um, and I'm involved in the Bremill project, and I think there's so much more information you found out in the most difficult of circumstances, so well done. I long to follow up with you on all those stories when we can meet. <laughs> yes, Thank you. Uh, Elio is very kindly helping us with e editing the, the work. She's a very experienced um, editor. Um, and has published her own uh, local history works as well. So she, she's outside of the parish, but nonetheless very welcome within, within our community here. So um, any other comments or questions from, from the audience? I can't see everybody, so please just speak up if, if, if you don't catch my eye. Um, 
Right, well, uh, Louise, I've, I've, I've got a question for you. Is on the, on the land army, um, that um, certainly in the Second World War, I know that really did continue on and, and a thing called the Women's Farm and Garden Trust came out of that. Did you come up with, and you said it had been disbanded after the, 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 the First World War, what, was there any sign of, of, of continuing organisation? Well, it's funny that you should say that because actually the land army was, um, they tried to encourage um, women's work to continue and it seemed to have morphed into encouragement of the uh, Women's Institute movement, which was somehow related to it. And, and actually, I think that there is possibly a local connection because um, the moves to get East Tiverton Village Hall built began in 1916. And I have to say, Alice Collett's husband was essentially behind the efforts. It took eight years for the, um, for the Village Hall to be built. And immediately in that year, the Women's Institute in East Tiverton was created. And I, I would like to believe that it was in somehow related to the war work that went on. Okay. Yeah, no, that make that makes sense. And, and did you come across any 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 um, what, what was any references to food and food availability during the um, First World War or lack? Uh, there was there was there was obviously a real um, scarcity. It was really important, and it wasn't just women that were carried on on to the land. I mean, obviously there were uh, prisoners of war, returning soldiers old men, I mean, anyone who could work was encouraged to do um, work in food uh, production. But I, I have to say some of the contributions of the women to um, the Red Cross Hospital do suggest that there was an awful lot of produce that was, and a huge range of produce. Um, I think a mini ship at Cadenham was contributing, not just things like uh, greens, but, you know, more exotic things like um, asparagus, I think she provided it at one point, <laughs> one point. And, you know, there was a lot of soft fruit and things like that that came from the Ferris household, uh, you know, plums, apples, medlars, things like that. So a, a broad community effort. And it sounds like people living in the in the countryside. Yeah. Better I off. mean, those food collections were quite amazing. It seems that weekly they would go around collecting eggs from Foxham, East Titherton and Titherton Lucas. So they were generally supplying, I don't know, at least three dozen eggs a, a week, which I think was probably going some. Chickens doing their bit, yes. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, any other questions? Um, William. Just, just a comment, I, I picked up, sorry, I joined late, but I picked up when you were talking about the Red Cross Hospital at Bowwood and surprise that there was a record of no Bremhill women working there. Um, just, uh, just an observation, a lot of the houses uh, in Bremer when they, they were built in 1875 by the estate were for retired uh, Bowwood workers. Yeah. So it may be that the population was actually a little elderly. Uh, possibly, yes. I know that there were estate workers who were living in Bremhill that were working on the estate um, during the, the war. Um, but I can't find anyone within Bremhill, either within the Red Cross record, and, and I did talk to the archivist who did provide me with another list of the uh, women who were employed there, and there were no local names. And I really found that surprising, but looking at the names, I do suspect that uh, Lady Lansdowne was probably employing women of middle or even you know gentry kind of class so yeah. i do think that she had in recruiting for her hospital a particular agenda if I can the, there was it was quite common in those days i think for 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 um certain volunteers to 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 to, to, to volunteer rather than you might say laboring Yes, yeah, definitely. But I think generally, you know, the, the work party and also at Chippenham, there was a real mix of women. You know, I was really surprised when I found Minnie Schiff at Cadden in Manor, for example. You know, in, so outside of Bowood, it was much more... Mm. Broadly based. Yeah. Thank you. Um, other questions, comments? Um, 
Helen. You're muted, Helen. Sorry. Uh, we need Jackie Weaver to keep me in order. <laughs> um, we have a parish uh, mark here, though. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you mentioned oral histories towards the end. Yeah. Uh, I know you were trying to collect those up by the middle of February. I just wondered what the time scale was now for collecting the final bits in for well, the book and what, what we could continue to contribute to. Yeah. Uh, I would encourage anyone uh, to send something in as, as quickly as possible. I have to say that in the last month, I've I've been much more hands off because I am waiting for uh, material to come in. I have had a lot of material um, or some material come in, but I really could do with with more and the more the better, really. But we've had some really wonderful and insightful um, stuff coming in. And I, and I just hope if we can just continue in that vein. Yeah. Um, Let's keep it coming. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I really want to spend most of March working on the book. So, you know, the sooner people send it in, the better. Although I, I can probably accommodate things, you know, in March if people if people want to send. And I wouldn't want to put anybody off. Great. Any other? David. Um, David, question. Good, good evening. Um, as Louise mentioned, um, Somebody in Bram Hill's grandmother was the cook and bottle washer. Uh, it's Jane Jordan of Jane and Nicole. It was Jane's grandmother, Mrs. Williams, that was the chief cook and also the entertainments officer. And indeed, the cookery book that she wrote all the recipes in is actually still in the village. Um, it's been copied for the museum, but it's in the village still. And it has such delicacies as nettle soup in it if anybody wants to borrow the book and try the soup. I made nettle soup this summer. It was wonderful. <laughs> the, the, the key thing with nettle soup is to pick it with gloves on because it's, it's, yes. it's neutralised once you've cooked it, but, but not while you And then pour it. boiling water over it in the sink. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Keeping your hands out. Oh, well, I know the editors of the newsletters watching. Um, I think nettle soup would be a, an excellent recipe. <laughs> it all comes down to the quality in of the, the stock. next month's magazine. Um, yeah. um, not to be picked anywhere where dogs frequent um, would be. No. Um, a, 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 um, and if you'd like to pick it, David, that's fine by me. Um, right. Any further questions on the um, on Louise's talk or, or anything else? I've I've just got one further one. Um, you mentioned the the, um, the dumb post, Louise. Do we know whether the pub's kept open? That's a very good point. I, <laughs> not something I considered. Not something I considered, but um, uh, I'll, I'll go and find out for you. I would imagine they must have done. One would hope so. It is, it is perhaps a thing that m many of us are, are missing during these current restrictions. Um, I've got a, a question here from uh, from Sophie, who's um, my daughter. Sophie, go on. Hi, I'm staying opposite Dad. You might be able to get an echo. Better? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm just talking. To <laughs> We're sitting opposite each other. Um, I just had a question for Louise. Um, I guess particularly doing the oral histories as well as some of the stories that you've uncovered. Um, did you get a sense of people's kind of attitudes evolving, even if they didn't continue actually working, that their kind of attitude towards women's work changed within the parish, like in the longer term? Uh, I mean, it definitely did change in the longer term. I mean, my, the research was very much focused on, um, on the on World War One, and I didn't go much beyond that, but certainly by World War Two, yes, it, it had. Although there was still a significant amount of um, uh, sexist attitudes going on, but um, you know, I was quite surprised just within World War One how you know on the one hand women were encouraged into um, into um, various trades, and and yet 
they weren't. It was always that ambivalence. Um, you know, I think I, I um, quoted the, um, the chap at the uh, Board of Agriculture, and I think that was really current. And as, as soon as they were asked, and as soon as the end of war happened, they just wanted women to go back into the box again. They just wanted, you know, women to stop. So even as part of the encouragement, they said that women after the war, you know, would have all these opportunities. They really didn't materialise, really. You know, uh, so. very interesting. Uh, Robert, did you have a question? Hmm. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Louise, is to carry on with the dumb post story. You kind of you give gives a glimmer, and I want to know what happened next. So the ladder. Yeah, yeah, I I really want to know too. I I want to just sort of go back because um, I love the way. Um, that he said that he couldn't possibly go to war because he was needed to farm their 11 acres so he couldn't possibly go. And, you know, the tribunal that sat were having absolutely none of it, you know, because he had a, a wife that could obviously work the land herself. And I think they said, you know, if she had trouble, then uh, she could call on a neighbour's help, you know. So did he go to war? Uh, uh, I don't... Um, uh, uh, I don't think they took the... No, I think he was asked to. I'll have to go back and have a look, but certainly they didn't seem to be having any of it. And a, a lot of the, the men who appealed, they might have um, been given one or two months grace, but generally speaking, you know, by 1917, it was like, you know, if you are an able-bodied man, you, you will go to war. Yeah, and it's interesting. Uh, I hadn't appreciated these war, these tribunals that um, sat um, uh, listening to these um, appeals against conscriptions seem to have happened weekly, and every week you see it appearing in the, in the local press. You know, uh, sometimes uh, you know it was you know fathers. Uh, saying that their sons couldn't go. Sometimes it was, you know, uh, men on, on their own behalf. Sometimes it was their, their mothers who appealed and just said, I can't possibly have my son go off. It was just, that was really fascinating, but it wasn't part of what I was looking at. Thank you, Louise. Yeah. Um, anyway. Can I just put one last question? I know it's stating the obvious, but I wonder if you could all look for things like um, diaries, notebooks, receipts, and photographs and if you know anybody even in covid times um if they could also look because that's where the gems come from they really do i mean on my book i did endless visits to local people and they certainly gave their best but during covid in the last two months one of the houses was sold the last of the old people has died off and there i helped do the clean out and it was heaving with material they'd forgotten about and wonderful stuff, which I would certainly put in the book. I mean, it was so sad, but there's nothing I can do, but it just goes to show people think they've looked, but often they haven't really. So anyhow, I say that in the hope that maybe something keep, might turn up. <laughs> keep, keep looking. Yeah. Uh, mm. Thank you. Um, I, I just wonder whether it might be helpful if we knew who had been interviewed and uh, stuff sent back to Louise. I mean, I can say so that we we were we we somehow we were in the picture a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, well, I I can send a, a list of um, the transcripts that I've had in certainly if that will be send helpful. Send those to the village coordinators, Louise. That's probably the right way to do it. Okay. <laughs> Rather than having the village coordinators. We are. <laughs> yeah. Thinking about GDPR, etc. I've just the, the conversation earlier about sort of the 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 um, the fact that women were asked to contribute and then were sort of stopped from contributing reminds me of a story um, that I've heard about football um, and apparently um, the football women's football became incredibly active and highly popular during the First World War because the men weren't 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 playing and there were sort of you know tr huge crowds of people going to watch women play football and then. Bang, 1921, it was banned, absolutely banned. And, and, and the whole nascent sort of women's football um, uh, industry was stopped in its tracks because the men were fearful about losing um, status, jobs, whatever. So um, 
I don't I, I don't think that, that well who knows whether there were any sporting activities that that that, that w women kept up in in Brembill, but it's it's a it's a it's the same pattern you you describe in terms in terms of sort of wanting yeah. to put back in their box at the end of hostility. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have to say that there was a ladies football team at the munitions factory in Chippenham. Cool. Uh, I don't know how long it lasted for, probably not very long, but it was certainly there. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's a fascinating story, but uh, we'll, have, we'll have to find make sure we've got a, Bre a Bremhill player in there, Louise. <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. All right, well, look, um, Thank you, Louise, for that for that fascinating talk and another set of really interesting stories. And we're shining a bright light on on some sort of forgotten corners of, of, of our parish's history, many of which will really add some texture and interest to the book. So um, um, we will um, continue with with um, with with our work. Please do feed stuff through to Louise, um, and we I will um, we will circulate information about the next talk um, within the next week or so. But um, thank you all for attending and good to see you all. Hope to see you in, in, in the, the flesh before too long as, as the vaccine program rolls out across the parish. Um, but uh, nice to see you all in the meantime anyway. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Bye. Louise.